Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what time zone you're in. I'm George Ingram. I'm a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, which is co-hosting this event today, uh, along with, and I also serve as chair of Friends of Publish What You Fund. Uh, welcome to the launch of the 2020 Publish What You Fund Index for IATI, the International Aid Transparency Initiative. What is IATI? using a common standard to which all donors and other organizations can report their data. IATI provides a framework through which data and information is publicly available on how and where organizations spend foreign aid money. The goal of which is to advance standards of living worldwide and reduce global poverty. The index is a system for measuring how organizations are doing in meeting their commitment to transparency through IID. The process is a consultative one. It engages with donors to help them improve the quality of their published data. Aid transparency has come a long way in a decade. Publish What You Fund was established in 2009 to advocate for aid transparency, primarily through robust publication. IID was formally launched two years later in 2011 as an initiative of civil society, DFID, the UNDP, and others. The U.S. committed to IATI in 2012. Today we are launching the seventh index that covers 47 organizations. You might say we are in the third phase of aid transparency. Phase one was about quantity convincing donors and other organizations to publish their aid data. Phase two was about quality, make the data more accurate, more rigorous. Phase three, which Gary Forster will introduce, is about engagement, using the data to engage stakeholders, especially for donors to use their data, to engage with local government officials and civil society so the data is used to inform better decisions and programming. We will begin today with a presentation by Gary on the findings of this year's index, which will be followed by a panel discussion. Gary Forster is CEO of Publish What You Fund. <clears throat> he brings to aid transparency several decades of working in assistance programs in the field, especially in the area of health in Africa. Gary? Over to you. Thank you, George. As George said, I'm Gary Forster and I'm proud to be the Chief Executive here at Publish What You Fund. Uh, let me also take the opportunity to welcome all of our viewers from around the world. We're delighted you could join us here today uh, for the launch of the 2020 Aid Transparency Index. Uh, for those of you who are new to the index, let me offer a brief explanation of how it works. The Aid Transparency Index is the only independent measure of aid transparency among the world's major aid donors. It is the result of a six month process where we check the aid data being shared by aid organizations using a combination of software and manual checks to test that agencies meet our criteria against 35 indicators, including things like financial and budget information, project location, impact and project performance. We do the data checks at two separate points which means we can provide feedback in between so that agencies can improve their transparency. We use these results to produce a score and rank the donors according to their levels of aid transparency. And this year we included 47 agencies. So I'm gonna be speaking for around 10 minutes before I hand back to George and our panelists for the discussion. And I want to cover three areas. Firstly, the context. And this is no general preamble. There are some very specific developments COVID included, which prevents some very real risks and opportunities for aid transparency globally. Secondly, we're going to dig into the results. Where have we made progress? Where are the gaps? Who has done well? Who hasn't? Thirdly and finally, and what George was alluding to there, we're going to talk about where we go from here. What does the future of aid transparency look like? So first of all, the context. We produced the 2020 Aid Transparency Index in the midst of the most serious and devastated pandemic in living memory. As of this morning, we have more than 9 million cases of COVID-19 globally, and we've seen more than 470,000 deaths as a result. 
The implications of the coronavirus pandemic for the aid sector include major impacts in both donor and partner countries. Bilateral, multilateral and philanthropic donors and the private sector are pledging, are pledging and committing and dispersing billions of dollars. As countries and international organizations quickly reallocate large quantities of aid to deal with the coronavirus pandemic, the decisions and actions they take should be open to public scrutiny. Meanwhile, the impending economic recession is going to result in aid budget cuts of tens of billions of dollars. Major donors are already reconsidering their budgets and planned activities, freezing and cutting substantial programs. Finally, we're seeing a resurgence of nationalist aid policy. We've seen national development finance institutions authorized to make investments on their own soil, and we've seen world leading aid agencies merged with much less transparent foreign ministries whose impact is unknown. Globally, ODA budgets are being spent by more and more government departments, some with limited development experience. So in short, there is a bigger need than ever before, less money available to address that need, and increasing calls to spend at home rather than when it's needed most. With resources stretched like this, governments must target and spend aid as effectively as possible. Aid transparency facilitates information sharing among donors and with partner governments. It is key to improve the efficiency of resource allocation, coordination of the response, and for donors to learn from one another's interventions. Proactive, timely, comprehensive, and open data on aid flows is also critical for public oversight and accountability. Before we move on to the results, I just want to quickly reflect on our launch in 2018. At that time, we were, rightly, challenged by a number of panelists to think about the broader development context. At that time, as is the case now, we were seeing substantial increases in spending by development finance institutions. And we've since started a whole piece of work looking into how to improve the transparency of these multi-billion dollar organizations, the activities they undertake and the impact they have. We were challenged to think about how transparency works at the local level. And our recent humanitarian transparency series launched just last week looks into precisely that. And we were challenged to think more broadly about how cross-cutting issues such as gender work can add value to the current aid data landscape. We've accepted these challenges and we look forward to reporting back on our progress in due course. So, on to the results. Before we get into the detail, let's be very clear on the headline. The 2020 Aid Transparency Index reveals an improvement in overall transparency among the world's major aid agencies but a worrying lack of transparency on the impact of aid projects. Donors are publishing increasingly more, better quality data in the International Aid Transparency Initiative Standard, also known as the IATI Standard. All of the donors, except those in the very poor category, are publishing IATI data about their activities and policies, meaning their information is open, timely, comparable, and centralized. 11 donors are now in the very good category, 15 in the good category. This means that over half of the 47 donors we assessed are now ranked as good or very good. A wide variety of aid donors are included in the 2020 index. Development finance institutions performed very well, taking four of the top five spots. However, several of these, including the Asian Development Bank, which topped the index ranking, were only assessed for their sovereign lending portfolios since they did not publish data about their private sector lending. The remainder of the very good category includes leading bilateral agencies, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, DFID and Global Affairs Canada, uh, the UN agencies UNDP and UNICEF, and the vertical funds Gavi and the Global Fund. At the other end of the spectrum, the bottom 10 performers include the UK's Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the Ministries of Foreign Affairs for Japan, Norway, Denmark, China, Ireland, and the UAE, the Development Agencies of Turkey and Saudi Arabia, and the US Department of Defense. Donors in the index have continued to publish data on a more regular basis. 62% of the donors assessed in the 2020 index published IRT data on a monthly basis, compared with only 51% in 2018. This shows an increasing systematization of publication among aid donors and means that more up-to-date, forward-looking data 
is available for stakeholders to enable better decision making and monitoring of aid activities. If we're going to tackle rapidly evolving challenges such as COVID, it's essential we have the most up-to-date information. Particularly noteworthy has been the performance of the six donors that were categorized as poor in 2018, but have been able to increase their publication quality and frequency significantly. A considerable achievement and an example of what is possible when donors apply attention to transparency. There's a great case study of New Zealand's experience within the full index report. However, there do remain challenges. There are persistent gaps in publication of performance data. While more donors are now publishing objectives, only a minority are publishing results of their projects. Fewer still are publishing project reviews and evaluations. It is not clear to us whether this is because that information is not being shared or whether it's simply not being collected in the first place. Without impact information, stakeholders monitoring donor projects have no way to gauge the effectiveness and value of aid spending, nor can donors extract learning from successful and unsuccessful projects. Among the bilateral donors we assessed are both development agencies and foreign trade or defense ministries that include aid delivery in their mandate. The development agencies generally perform better in the index than non-specialized ministries. This graph shows a comparison between the scores of aid agencies and foreign ministries of the countries which we assessed for both types. Another finding is that the index itself continues to drive behavior towards greater transparency and openness among aid donors. After we share initial results from data collected at the start of the process, donors work to improve their data in time for the final round of data collection. The average score based on the first set of data this time round was 54.4 across all of the donors, and this average increased by nine points to 63.4 when we assess the final set of data four months later. The way scores improve during data collection is evidence of the value of the index process itself. So finally, where do we go from here? We've talked about the current context. Aid is going to be more stretched than ever, and as such has to be targeted as precisely and implemented as effectively as possible. We've explored the results of the 2020 Aid Transparency Index. The overall message is positive, more and better data, but the lack of impact data is a serious concern and as is the performance of some of the major aid agencies who simply aren't pulling their weight. So given what we know, what does the future of aid transparency look like? Beyond the index, the Publish What You Fund team engage on a broad range of transparency research and advocacy efforts. Increasingly, our work is highlighting the extent to which aid transparency has become too top down, focused on publication of large data sets at the headquarters level and not much else. We recognize that we've arguably, sorry, we recognize that we've arguably been part of the problem. The index rewards the publication of large volumes of timely, comparable and good quality data. It doesn't reward efforts by donors to ensure that this data is used at a country level by agency staff, either to support their own decision-making processes or to engage with stakeholders, including partner governments and CSOs. As a result, we have donor country offices that are unaware of the wealth of data and information that exists and stakeholders on the ground who perceive certain actors as untransparent despite their commendable publishing practices at the headquarters level. In such a situation, with no one reviewing the numbers, there are no feedback loops, so quality issues in the data can remain for long periods without being identified and addressed. We need to transition from a concept of data use to one of data engagement. To date, there has been an underlying assumption of if you build it, they will come. If you publish it, they will use. Our own research report called With Publication Comes Responsibility identified the need for age agencies to use their own data for strategic planning and local engagement. And working with our partners, we have seen firsthand the variety of stakeholders that seek aid data, ranging from CSOs and elected representatives to think tanks and central banks. But let us separate out data use from data engagement. Data use assumes the existence of a usable data set that meets the need of every type of user and implies individuals or organizations with the agency ability and incentives to use data. Data use also suggests a distant, hands-off relationship between the data producer and the end user. 
when we talk about data engagement, we're talking about reducing that distance. We're talking about donor agencies meeting with their counterparts, using the data as a basis for discussion, talking about planned activities and ongoing successes and failures. That's how we identify data needs. That's how we find gaps in the data. That's how we build trust between partners and that's how we make sure our development decisions are informed by evidence. So in the coming months, we will be looking into how donors can do data engagement. We'll be speaking with donors and partner country governments and CSOs, and we'll also be looking at how we can incorporate data engagement into the Aid Transparency Index methodology for future iterations. As we embark on this, we'd love to hear about ideas and approaches and experience, experiences of where this has been done well. Ultimately, we all want local partners and implementers to own their own development. And that includes their response to COVID. And we believe that data engagement is an important way to enable that. So as I conclude, I'd just like to say a couple of quick thank yous. Firstly, thank you to all of the agencies who engaged with us throughout the index process. Secondly, I want to thank the 34 independent peer reviewers who helped scrutinize the process and scoring. Their input is invaluable for ensuring a rigorous and fair process. And I want to thank the Publish What You Fund team, Alex Tilley, who led the research with the support of Elmer Jenkins and everyone else who has at some point chipped in over the last six months to make this report a reality. For those of you who are new to the index, it really does take six months to produce. It involves full reviews of all donors' data and requires the manual sampling of tens of thousands of documents. On that note, I'd like to pass back to George. Gary, thanks very much for that review of the find, findings of the 2020 index. Uh, before moving on to the panel, let me pick up on one point you made. And you made the point that their funders, donors are increasing funding in response to COVID, but reducing funding for traditional programs. <clears throat> I, also, <clears throat> I also know that IATI has adopted recently a COVID markup. How quickly can we see this shift in funding in IATI? <clears throat> Is it a matter of months or longer? Thank you, George. Um, so we're already seeing the data, as you rightly point out, um, IATI, as well as um, the UN OCHA's Financial Tracking Service, and as well as the OECD DAC, have all provided guidance in how um, aid agencies and implementers should report their information and how they can use COVID markers or activity tags uh, to, to highlight when an activity is COVID related. Um, we're already seeing the data produced. Um, we're seeing it visualized through platforms such as uh, the portal, which visualizes IRT data, um, the donor aid agency's own portals, which run off of their IRT data. Um, and the last time I checked, which was this morning, uh, we had more than 900 uh, activities uh, on those portals that are tagged with those markers. So we're definitely seeing as organizations produce um, a report on their COVID activities, we're definitely seeing that uh, come through uh, as those organizations um, or in, in time with those organizations regular uh, frequency of publication. Right. Thank you, Gary. Um, Gary's going to stay on the panel and we're now going to move to the other three members. <clears throat> Nora O'Connell is Vice President for Public Policy and Advocacy at Save the Children USA. <clears throat> and co-chair SAVE's global campaign on empowering girls. Um, this is an issue she knows very well, as when she joined SAVE, she had already become a leader in advocating for the advancement of women and girls. Uh, she also serves as a board member of Friends of Public Switch and Fund. Secondly, Henry Assort brings direct engagement, and remember that term engagement that Gary emphasized, with today's topic. He manages the assistance database at the Nigerian Ministry of Finance, Budget, and National Planning, to which position he brings over a decade of experience on aid data, transparency, and development cooperation. He also serves as alternate vice chair of the governing board of IATI. Um, and thirdly, Scott Hocklander, is the mission director for USAID in Moldova. His career at USAID has spanned the world. Besides his current position in Moldova, 
He has served in Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. So Scott, let me pose the first question to you. How do you engage with stakeholders generally? And how do you share data and information? Specifically, what types of organizations are your principal stakeholders? What information and data do you need to engage with them? And what is the form of that engagement? Obviously, engagement prior to COVID-19, because we all know what engagement is like right now. Scott? Yeah, so um, first of all, I just wanted to thank uh, the Brooks Institution for hosting event to publish uh, what you fund for the A Transparency Index. Just congratulations on that. Um, I particularly, you know, have, uh, I think it's fantastic um, in terms of the move, uh, you know, the evolution, George, you talked about, and Gary, what you talked about in terms of the focus on engagement, how important that is, um, you know, compared to uh, just focusing on data quality or quantity. Um, USAID is very committed to transparency. Uh, I'm very, very pleased to, to see that uh, USAID has, has moved up that list a little bit um, by eight points. We're near the top of the, the good part of that, which is exciting to see. Um, I think it reflects, uh, you know, commitment both in terms of the quality side as well as the frequency of the publication. And uh, USAID is definitely um, focused on trying to make sure this data reaches a local level and it's used at the local level and has done things um, already in terms of uh, translating some of the machine um, data, uh, I added data into French, Spanish, and Portuguese, as well as uh, launching the development cooperation landscape tool, which I'll talk about in a bit. Um, as far as, you know, I, as I was, as I was thinking through, um, you know, who, who do you, who do you talk to and who do you share information with? And it was more like, who don't I share information with? Who are we not talking? In fact, it seems like um, the, the more I, you know, get into my career, um, the, the, the people that we don't talk to becomes less and less as we realize that, you know, everyone really needs to be involved in development, uh, you know, with, with re resources being finite as they are, um, you know, to, to leave any part of the society somehow untouched from that conversation is to basically miss out on something extremely important, you know, uh, an important leverage, an important connection, et cetera. So uh, in that sense, um, you know, it's, it's everyone really. Uh, and, as far as like how how we share data and i think um you know both uh, gary and george will talked about um the differences like the difference between use and and engagement and i think that's really important um when when i think when i think about information and i think about uh, the availability of it there's almost like this hierarchy of 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 real uh, utilization engagement you can just get it for info purposes you can use it to just deep deconflict in terms of uh you know, what another partner is doing versus what you're doing. You can actually use it to coordinate, you know, to where we'll do this, you do this, um, you know, very intentionally to partner, to actually partner with someone and say, okay, let's both do this. And then to me, sort of like, you know, towards the last part that which gets to, I think the engagement point, it's really about collaboration. And that is to have that information basically upfront in the process. So you begin to, to look at activities, you, you, you basically work on, the problem set, you know, from the beginning, and then everything from that is done, you know, in in collaboration, in tandem, you know, with your stakeholders. And so, having having that information available, having the same language, you know, that everybody understands, um, is is incredibly important, uh, you know, to really get to that higher level of of collaboration. Um, you know, in in terms of uh, in terms of Moldova, you know, I think that. Uh, I think that we've done a pretty good job at the technical level, um, by and large, you know, amongst, you know, ourselves, other bilaterals, our implementing partners, the, the host nation, of course, um, and, uh, and the beneficiaries, you know, they, they've done a good job of coordinating um, through, through meetings, uh, both, you know, before and now. Um, the, the challenge, are, sometimes I think we could do better is terms of uh, the strategic level coordination, where sometimes it often it off ends up being a little ad hoc, information is shared through meetings through you know the coordination meetings when they happen um and of course when we go in and, and you know have our engagement uh with the host nation so uh, anything that can bring i think further um organization further structure uh to that and you know as i, as I was thinking through the, the the data and a little bit the tool that i'll talk about in a bit 
Um, a lot of it has, a lot of just basically seeing some basic information on what your partners are doing allows you to have a conversation, allows you to know who to talk to. Um, it gives you, it gives you like a, a starting point. And I would also just say, you know, one other thing that's really important about um, data um, is, again, with finite resources, we can't, no one donor, no one organization can cover everything. You know, it's really responsible that we all work together to try and have a, a broad and comprehensive impact, you know, across the, uh, across the development challenge. You know, and I think with the USAID, who really, we're really focusing on countries, individual countries' journey to self-reliance, um, you know, it's, it's really making sure that all the, the, the parts of development challenge are being addressed, you know, um, you know, at one time uh, and having a, a broad, a broad base of information to help us determine what really is our comparative advantage versus a, another donor or partner, et cetera, is, uh, is, is great. So I think I'll, I think I'll stop there, uh, you know, pending the further questions. Scott, thanks. Um, you mentioned this new portal that AID has put up. Uh, requested by aid missions to make IOD data more widely available. Tell us about this new tool, how it's being used, and how it's being used to share data um, and deepen relationships with stakeholders. Yeah, so I think this this story probably you know started a few years ago. Um, you know, as uh, as USAID got more involved in terms of uh, you know providing the the uh, machine readable I added data. Um, you know, for those of us to, who don't like see X's and O's, um, uh, actually, you know, being able to engage, you know, with that data, understand that data is really critical. And so I think a lot of mission directors like myself were asking, hey, is there, is there an interface or something that can be developed in which this data can then go in and then we can, you know, engage with it in different ways, visually list, download um, basically across the, the board. And I think it's really from that, uh, from that, um, that request, USAID, you know, uh, thought to itself, okay, let's, I think we need to do something here. Um, obviously the, the, the positives in terms of um, having a, a tool like that uh, are endless, not, you know, going, you know, beyond just alignment, reducing duplication, you know, helping with the development of strategies, et cetera. So um, that's, that's really sort of the, the genesis of the tool. Um, and uh, I think maybe I'll just go to the slide, David, if you wanna pop up the first one. So um, just in terms of find, you know, finding this, uh, it's, the, it's on the uh, Foreign Aid Explorer website, which is something that uh, everyone has access to. Um, if you go down, uh, if you see on the left, it has beyond USG, you hit that and then basically that takes you to the um, development cooperation uh, landscape tool. Um, you know, the, the first slide um, that basically you come to allows you to input the country that you want to uh, are looking at. In this case, um, the slide shows that Moldova has already been entered into the, entered into it and it's popped up. Um, it's got, it's got a few screens. I think um, showing the map itself, I think is, uh, is really nice. Um, gives you a visual of where development act activities are taking place um, in the country. You have the ability to choose from different sectors, different organization types um, to really uh, describe like what, what exactly view that you wanna see um, separate it out. Um, it, uh, and then if you actually click um, on the dots itself, it then pops up you know, further, further information about what's actually happening, you know, including, um, including the dates, uh, you know, more, more uh, specific information as well. Um, there's also, you can't see it on this, but there's also some third party um, data that I think is also helpful as far as providing the general context of what's happening. There's trends in terms of showing the different levels of uh, assistance that's been provided by um, bilateral donors, multilateral donors, et cetera. Uh, next slide, David. Uh, and this, um, and then further, further down, if you continue to scroll down, you can get actually into more detail. And this is really where it uh, gives activities themselves. So um, again, you search by, you know, the particular area which you're interested in. You're able to go and see all of the different activities uh, that are being implemented in the country, you know, who, who's implementing them. Um, click on them and find, you know, uh, a, a really an amazing amount of information about what's happening. So, you know, just to give you a sense of, uh, of how we would, how we use a tool. Um, I mean, it's, 
we're, we're always, we're always seemingly asking ourselves, Hey, what are, what are the other donors doing, um, you know, versus what we're doing. And, uh, you know, this year in particular, USAID in Moldova is uh, in the process of developing a new five-year strategy. So one of the key parts of developing that strategy in terms of the work leading up to it is, is, is basically doing donor mapping. So we use the tool like early on basically to help us sort of develop the initial concepts behind um, the strategy uh, to, to figure out who we needed to talk to as, as we, uh, for example, put together a, uh, a list of organizations that we wanted to send out our survey to. Um, to, to really make sure that we knew which sectors we wanted to focus on. So I think there's also not only a present importance, but also you can go back in time. There's historical data that you, that you can really, I think, be informed by. And then to actually use the information to develop, you know, the more formal donor mapping part that, uh, that informs our strategy. So that's just, I mean, I think that's just uh, one example of which, you know, we've been using it for. Um, but, you know, also, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, it's, uh, it really helps like in preparation um, for a meeting or knowing who to talk to, to be able to go in and get really specific, um, ask questions about something. And it really starts a conversation going, I think in a way that uh, is, uh, is quite effective. So um, yeah, stop there, pending more questions. Thanks very much, Scott. <clears throat> uh, let's move from <clears throat> Moldova to Nigeria. Uh, Henry, what do you do? You're in the field. You're responsible for data. What are your responsibilities? What information and data do you need in order to fulfill your responsibilities? And how does that process work in Nigeria? Henry, you need to uh, unmute yourself. There we go. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. My responsibility in the ministry is to manage the official aid information management system of the government. Uh, in that role, I work closely with relevant departments and units within the Ministry of Finance, Budget, and National Planning, specifically the International Cooperation Department, the Monitoring and Evaluation Department, and the IT unit on their respective rules and responsibilities with respect to the utilization of the aid information management platform. I also liaise with all development partners in the country, including relevant government stakeholders, both at the national and subnational levels, to ensure effective utilization of the aid management platform, particularly with respect to the regular and reliable data reporting into the system. I also ensure timely generation and dissemination of executive reports from the system to the ministry and other stakeholders, including the Central Bank of Nigeria, the Budget Office, the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit, the Nigerian <laughs> Parliament, development partners, civil society organizations, media organizations, and so on. I also carry out periodic training of focal persons from the development partners, as well as relevant government MDAs on how to upload data into the system, as well as other activities that will strengthen and improve the performance of the system as a repository of aid data in the country. So in a nutshell, those are my responsibilities and what I do. I, Oh, sorry. Then in terms of the kind of data that I need, I need data that is disaggregated by the donor, the donor category that is multilateral donors, bilateral donors, international non-governmental organizations, development finance institutions, and further disaggregated into sectors, geographical locations, Transaction, transaction types, whether they are grants, whether they are loans, whether they are, the, the assistance is technical or whether it's materials that are bought. Essentially, information that provides complete picture of donor intervention in the country. 
Now, this data is used to determine the external aid flows to different sectors and to different geopolitical zones in the country. The, the data also helps us to pre prevent duplication of activities and promote equitable distribution of the aid. The central bank, for instance, uses the data for the computation of balance of payment. The data is also used to gauge whether projects are in fact implemented efficiently and whether the intended outputs are delivered. But also if these activities produce results that will contribute to national development. So the, the data also assists our policy makers and planners, in fact, the management of the ministry to take decisions on future development activities as well as support the budget formulation process. As you know, we are the ministry that <laughs> prepares the budget for the country. Henry, thank you very much for that. Uh, before I go to a second question, let me note for everybody uh, that the hashtag for submitting questions are hashtag 2020 index. So Henry, what are the main issues that you have with donor data? How do any problems affect the ability for you to implement programs? And how can donors address those issues? In fact, the main issue that we have with donor data is untimely entry of data by some donors. Some of the donors are up to date with reporting but some are not up to date. And then that leads to having incomplete data. And then some donors use in-house reporting systems and therefore regard the use of the government aid management platform as a kind of mul multiple taxing. Another issue we have again is the frequent turnover of focal persons from the donor side. You know, some donors engage their staff on contract basis. And when the duration of the contracts, the contract elapses, then they have, there will be a gap or they get a new staff who will now start the process afresh. And then also the issue of low organizational commitment. Some of the donors are not really committed to transparency and accountability. The implication of not having accurate, complete, and timely data is that we cannot rely on the data for planning and decision making. In fact, we cannot account for the donor assistance if we don't have evidence by way of data. So with regards to what the donors should do to address these issues, first, I would say that the donors should follow the standard operating procedures as issued to them and report data on a regular basis. The donors should also assign a focal person to report their data in line with our ODA policy, our official development assistance policy. The focal persons should now provide basic information on, the, on their projects, including the project location, the amount committed, the amount disbursed. And then the focal persons should also attend our refresher trainings, our brainstorm meetings, and provide us with feedback on what we can do to improve the system so that we can co-create, we can co-create solutions together. Thank you very much, Henry. Uh, so Nora, much of the emphasis of your work at SAVE is to build local ownership and empower local actors. So development is done with the full participation of civil society and partner countries. Can you say a bit more about why this is such a critical step? 
Absolutely, and thank you, George, and thank you for Publish What You Fund for convening this panel. And I'm very excited to actually be on this panel with a mix of government leaders, donors, and of course, be, being able to represent civil society because those are really the key actors that need to come together in order for data to be used in ways that really have an impact on people's lives. And the reason that local ownership is so critical and civil society in particular is that, you know, the key to countries making progress is actually when you have effective accountable governments and informed and engaged people. And so that's really the locus of where change happens. And so if you have aid projects or aid data that aren't actually in that ecosystem between the people in a country and their governments, then the aid actually is not going to be as effective as it could be. And, you know, so we really see that engagement piece as foundational and data as sort of uh, as an element in that conversation. And data in particular, I think, um, is really critical because it provides a place for a common understanding around both problems and solutions. So data, you know, takes all kinds of forms in terms of um, not only what funding, what kind of funding is going, where that funding is going, who that funding is benefiting, what are the outcomes being achieved through that funding. That whole continuum is really critical. And the reason local ownership is so vital to that is that Sitting in a place like Washington, D.C., where I usually work, when we look at aid data, we very often start from the U.S. government, right? What is our government doing? What are those projects achieving? And, and members of Congress are talking about, is that aid being accountable to U.S. tax taxpayers who are funding that assistance? But when the conversation is actually centered in communities, the conversation is actually focused on what are the changes that people want in their own lives? How are they defining the problems and solutions? And what are their governments doing to drive change? And what are donors doing to drive change? So it flips the paradigm and puts the US government as one of many actors in, in uh, with a focus on change and accountability to those communities versus it being about a community accountability to, for example, US, uh, US taxpayers. So um, just to give an example of where we sometimes run into problems, and right now we're actually doing some research in Niger around the issue of ending child marriage. And the government has actually stepped up its leadership on this issue in recent years and is developing a costed national action plan on how to address this issue. And to understand what's at stake for the country, 76% of girls in Niger are married before the age of 18. 28% of girls are married before the age of 15. Right, so this is something that has massive implications for the population. And it's also important to note that the leading cause of death for girls around the world in ages 15 to 19 is maternal mortality. So when you take an issue like early marriage, it's a human rights and gender-based violence issue. It is a survival issue, literally, for those girls. And it's also a massive economic issue for a country. Niger is also a country that um, is very aid dependent. Aid plays a big role in, in that country, and in that budgeting. So the Ministry of Planning in Niger is, has its cost to national action plan and is trying to look at what is aid funding and what, is, uh, what are they funding through their domestic programs and civil society coalition of both international organizations like ours, but mostly local civil society are at the table really trying to advocate and get a clear picture so that they can both urge their governments to invest in this and hold them accountable for it. And one of the things that they're finding is that picture that the Ministry of Planning has of aid data is very inadequate. It's actually undercounting a lot of resources according to a lot of those partners who are arguing that their resources aren't reflected there. So because of a lack of quality of aid data, they, you know, you have this political, increased political will by the government to address this. The Ministry of Planning is taking it on. And you're ending up with sort of this uh, fight over what donors are doing instead of being able to actually get a picture, accurate picture of the resources, create a shared understanding across civil society, government, and across those donors to really drive progress on an issue where people's lives are at stake and they're critical to the growth of the economy. So, um, so that's an example of how aid data, if it were stronger, would actually unlock collaboration and where aid data isn't working, it actually gets in the way of progress. 
Nora, you've given us a very powerful example of how data can make a difference in trying to address the issue of, of identifying the problem of early marriage in Niger and how to address that. And do you have other examples of how the, the data can be used for engagement, for this sort of new phase of engagement that helps strengthen local ownership and leads to better development outcomes? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. And I think, you know, your focus on engagement is the right thing because of course, sometimes um, people sort of mistake data for the answer. The data will tell us the answer. And what data needs to do is actually inform a conversation because we also know that there are huge gaps in data. And if you take data for the answer, then basically you're imposing the limitations of the data on the solutions and on your understanding of a problem. So it's a really critical foundation, but it's not, it's not the be all and end all. Um, another research project that actually we're undertaking that's around that is in uh, the East and Southern Africa region, where we're looking at six countries and trying to understand what is actually the ODA investment in children's rights issues. And so we're doing that, that in partnership, again, with a number of regional or, and uh, national organizations with six countries in the region, and engaging with stakeholders in both the government and at the donor level to try and get a, an understanding of this picture. And one of the things that we're learning is, again, we, it's hard to get the exact data on what the investments are, right? So that's a challenge for that. But on the positive side, it is actually opening up a conversation about the blind spot in the data around child rights. And again, to go back to the example of why it's important to be able to pull out disaggregated data on who an aid project is benefiting. We talked about this example of maternal mortality and the leading cause of death for girls 15 to 19 around the world. Well, sexual and reproductive health programs could actually address that, for that issue. But if you don't know what age the sexual and reproductive health programs are reaching, you don't actually know if those adolescents who often have a harder time reaching, reaching health services are benefiting from these investments in sexual and reproductive health, right? You don't know if they are, uh, if it's impacting mortality rates in this most vulnerable group of the population. So um, what's good about the, the aid data that we do have and the research that we're undertaking with partners is that process of actually doing the research and asking the questions is actually building partnerships across civil society and with governments and with donors to have a conversation about what those investments are and what do people see about the needs what are countries themselves investing and where are the gaps? So even where the, the aid data is imperfect, it can actually drive a conversation and build partnerships for people who are seeking answers and are seeking to drive change. No, Nora, just an aside, um, I think your, your collective answers there give a really strong explanation as to why SAVE is supporting Public Fortune Fund in its new pub project on how to get better gender data. So. Thanks for that. Um, so let's move on to questions that were submitted with the registration and have come in this morning on Twitter. We have just over 10 minutes to address a couple of questions. And not surprising, the questions that came in tend to be focused on current events. And the question that was repeated multiple times has to do with the merger of DFID into FCO and what the panelists, how they assess that impact. Um, I'm gonna take the prerogative of the chair uh, to opine on this because it's something I feel very strongly about. And I think I speak for many of my colleagues in development in the United States. We have viewed DFID as a thought leader and a preeminent actor in development using its independence to put development and poverty reduction at the forefront of British foreign aid. This position is now put in jeopardy by being subordinated to short-term transactional foreign policy interest. Um, but let me turn first to Gary because the index rates both um, FCO and DFID and then move to Henry for a, a view from the field and to Nora to see how civil society in the US sees this. Gary? Thanks, George. Um, okay, I'll try, and, I'll try and stay objective. So 
in terms of the most common question we've had in the last week is what is going to be the impact um, on the transparency of UK aid if these two organizations merge and we were to review these uh, this single organization coming out of it um, through the index methodology and the simple answer is if we took all of the data and the publication practices that we currently see from both organizations and we put it together um, the score would be lower than, than DFID currently is there's a lot of devil in the detail it would be somewhere part way between DFID and FCO so that so the headline is we're, we're expecting less um, we're expecting less transparency as, as a result. I think the major concerns are around FCO's impact data. So if you if you go through the report, you'll see that um, it, it publishes almost no um, performance data, objectives, evaluations, results, and, and so on, and its activities. There's a little bit of a bright side with FCO. They have increased the frequency of their publication. They are now publishing on a quarterly basis. Um, so every three months, but there's there's a question for us around whether that's enough in a in a COVID um, in a COVID world where we have to respond um, uh, quickly. So, in a nutshell, as the global campaign for aid and development transparency, the merger um, makes us extremely nervous. Not only because it comes at a time um, when the UK government's own aid transparency targets are about to expire, but also because there's just no confidence has been provided that that either the Parliamentary International Development Committee uh, nor the UK's Independent Commission on uh, Aid Impact will will continue in their current form. So there's a big question mark around how scrutiny is going to work. Um, and as it stands right now uh, in the UK, we're potentially facing a, a transparency black hole. Now, all is not lost. Um, we think there are some specific things that need to be done to to, to address this ahead of a merger between DFID and FCO. Firstly, on targets, the UK government needs, um, as a matter of urgency, to recommit to the targets that were in its 2015 to 2020 strategy, uh, whereby all government departments spending uh, official development assistance have to score good or very good at using the index methodology. And of course, that those targets are about more than just DFID and FCO and the new entity. They're also about um, the more than 10 other government departments in the UK that are um, spending ODA. Um, secondly, we, we want this uh, institution to continue global leadership around transparency. DFID not only led the, the index for many years, but also led the push for greater transparency globally and was central to the formation of the International Aid Transparency Initiative. So the UK government should soon confirm its commitment to continuing support for IATI uh, as an initiative uh, and commit to, to membership for the foreseeable future. And then thirdly and finally, um, we, we need to get into the detail. The UK government needs to recognise the importance of DFID's aid management and reporting systems. You, you don't become a world leader uh, without world leading infrastructure and, and yes we're talking about the technical back office software and processes but this stuff matters and if if the government is serious about ensuring that UK aid maintains its world leading uh, position, then they need to confirm that these systems, these approaches that DFID has honed over the years and that have led it into this position, um, in terms of how it reports on its activities, in terms of how it ensures it's transparent, we need to make sure that those systems take precedent for all ODA managed by the new office. So hopefully that provides some, some detail on the kind of things that we're thinking about here. Thanks, Gary. Henry, I assume that uh, DFID is one of your partners and aid donors and uh, you deal with them regularly. And, and what are your thoughts? Well, for us, um, I would say that it is still early to see what the impact will be. But as for how uh, we engage with the donors here, usually there is a cooperation agreement that is signed between the government and the development partners. And there is also um, a collaboration in preparation of the work plan. The, the work plan is usually jointly prepared. And in terms of uh, data, uh, DFID is one of the organizations that has a dedicated focal person that, a focal person that reports the organizational data. And so they are usually up to date with the data. So like I said, it's still too early to uh, determine what the impact of the major will be. Nora, I assume SAVE, US and SAVE International has a lot of dealings with DFID. 
George, I, I would say, you know, our colleagues in the UK are really concerned about this move and, um, and sort of losing that focus on addressing poverty and inequality that DFID has been real leader in the aid world on. And in the US, actually, we're concerned about it as well, because as you said, DFID has been a thought leader. And the US, uh, among other donors, has kind of looked to DFID as a model and what can we learn from their successes. And as you know, uh, when USAID was originally created, it was an independent agency, but for the past 30 years or so, it's actually been reporting through the Secretary of State. And there's been this tension about the level of independence of USAID and if it should be just a tool of our diplomacy or if it really needs to have be recognized with its own voice, its own expertise, and its own mission. So I think, you know, not only are we concerned in terms of the impact of DFID's work on the ground, but we're also concerned that U.S. policymakers may look and see what's happened in Britain and use it as a model, which we think would have, you know, terribly negative effects for children and families around the world who really need the U.S. and DFID to be strong partners in development. Thanks, Nora. Um, a second question, which is not surprising, is on people's mind is what's the impact of COVID-19? How is it impacting on your work? Henry, how have you seen COVID-19 impact your data needs and, and your work? Okay, for, um, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Well, uh, for the most time of uh, uh, this period, we have been on lockdown and have been working at home. And um, the government has gradually re um, eased the lockdown, so we are back to our offices. Um, it has had a great impact really, but from a data perspective, I will say that this is, it is very crucial now at this time of COVID-19 for us to have more data reported because if there is no data, it will be difficult to account for the resources that has been expended on the pandemic interventions. And there is also the risk of some of the resources ending up in the pockets of corrupt individuals. So as a matter of policy and transparency, it is imperative that we have more data at this time. Thank you. And Scott, how is this affecting AID's work in Moldova? Yeah, thanks, George. I mean, you know, when it, when it comes to, uh, you know, an emergency situation, you know, the stakes, the stakes rise, you know, very quickly in terms of, uh, you know, the, the need to do things quickly, uh, the resources involved, uh, and the, the demands on, you know, data just go through the roof, um, you know, right off the bat. And I mean, there's a, there's a process, I think, that ends up taking place where, um, you know, everyone needs to, to get together, uh, decide who has ability to do different things, start to set up systems. And there's a bit of, not necessarily reinventing the wheel, but reinventing, you know, or, or developing the structure that's gonna basically take the, the community forward in terms of, in terms of responding. Um, you know, the, the part, and I, I guess I'll get back to engagement a little bit on this and how important engagement is. Um, you know, prior, you know, when you're in a situation where um, it's, it's, you're not required to uh, engage remotely all the time, the, there is there is like on the margins I think a very important important opportunity for people to to talk about the information and really we don't have that opportunity anymore and it's it's really required I guess uh, folks to be really much more intentional in terms of going out and talking you know about about information you can't you know see somebody you know in the evening after a long day's work in, in a more of a social setting and really be able to talk through things and come up with solutions. That, you know, it's really, you have to work a lot harder, I guess, to create those kinds of spaces um, to really get at what you need. And, and so I think that's like, I think that's a major challenge. And I'll, you know, and, and you know, and maybe just going back to uh, the tool a little bit and, and maybe to another point, and that is, um, 
it really, I think, requires, uh, you know, all of the partners to have the mentality of we need to engage, we need to share, we need to think through these things together at all levels. And if you don't, if you don't, if you haven't like figured that out, if you haven't um, developed that, that memory, that approach, et cetera, before an emergency, it makes it really hard, even more hard to try and do that during an emergency. And I've sort of found that to be true um, with any real practice. If you're not good before the stakes are high, then you're going to really struggle, you know, when the stakes are high. And so I think, you know, um, it, when, when you can, obviously continuing to, to develop interfaces, you know, like the um, development cooperation landscape or other things like that, I think we just need to continue to work together to develop that, not only as professionals now, but make sure, you know, that kind of information is also, I think, in the education system as, you know, people who enter the field, they bring that approach with them, the ability to look and analyze data, you know, I think is also a, a really important aspect. Thank you. Nora, we're at the witching hour, so you get the final word. So I'll be very quick. Um, in terms of how COVID-19 has affected our, our use of data, on the positive side, it's actually pushed us to use technology in ways to gather data from people about their needs and experiences that we could have done before, but we weren't taking advantage of it. So it pushed us to innovate and to use the tools that we had in new ways that was really um, useful. It also, though, has limitations because, for example, a lot of people have heard about the shadow pandemic of gender-based violence that's impacting women and girls who are, who are trapped in their homes. It's actually not safe to ask for data about what they're experiencing right now. So we're having to rely on data from previous crises like the Ebola epidemic to, to be able to take those lessons from before and to make assumptions about what's happening now because it's not safe to collect that data. So that flexibility about finding new ways to learn what we can, but also applying lessons to the past are really critical. And I think Scott's point on engagement is key. We are seeing a lot of closing of civic space. And so that active commitment from host country governments, from donor partners, from civil society to create that space for that dialogue right now is really critical because we are seeing that be a huge challenge. And ultimately we need that partnership to be able to make the change we wanna happen and to help families be resilient during this time and to be able to come back. Thanks, Nora. Uh, let me close this event, uh, noting that the conversation is gonna stay open on Twitter for a couple of days. So go to, hashtag um, 2020 index. Um, and let me thank the panelists, Nora, Scott, Henry, Gary, for giving us these insights into the 2020 index and to what its implications are and urge everybody to go to the Publish What You Fund website to access uh, the report. And uh, have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, George. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.